Okay, so my uh, pro I, I want to speak about the project, uh, the title which you see at the screen it is places and spaces in and outside of the university, and which uh, I want to implement at least European University. And I think that this is, uh, for me, it's kind of exciting project, it is related with places, it's related with uh, spaces, and I want to share uh, my, uh, how to say, tentative plan of this project. I will gladly hear your suggestions, your criticisms, and your opinions about it. Well, origins about the, of the project, I consider it necessary to speak uh, about how this project originated. Uh, Professor Paul Gibbs, I think in 2020, back had a, uh, a presentation about transdisciplinarity at Center for Higher Education Futures, so back in pandemics. And uh, after this meeting, they emerged a transdisciplinarity group, so to say, where Professor Gibbs, Professor Greenwood, Professor Bankston and I this were, were meeting online once a month regularly and we're discussing uh, some issues. We just, it was a haven for me, uh, intellectual haven for exchanging uh, ideas. And uh, at one of such uh, meetings, I have encountered that uh, uh, Soren and Professor Rike Norgard have written the paper, Academic Citizenship Beyond the Campus. And also Soren shared us with his paper, Moving Beyond Education. And this was kind of a uh, discovery for me because uh, I uh, did my dissertation about philosophical geography. And that was about considering places and spaces and identities into philosophical perspective. And I tried to uh, combine philosophical reflections with empirical study. And uh, this uh, humble, so to say, attempt is summarized in my two works. One is quite uh, small, Shatili from the perspective of philosophical geography. Shatili is a small village in northern mountainous region of Georgia. It's called Hefsureti. And there I conducted a two months uh, participant observation and I summarized my findings at small work. And the second is philosophical geography, history, problems, and perspectives. It was my uh, dissertation published where I more, mostly uh, highlight my theoretical framework. So uh, that's why I was fascinated that in higher education studies also uh, this, the importance of places and spaces uh, was emphasized and this was a great discovery for me. So the theoretical background for my project are the following authors, which you see on the screen. Heidegger is a well-known German philosopher of 20th century, perhaps the most famous one. And in his complex thinking, especially in the second uh, half of his thinking, he uh, theorized much about place and uh, places and spaces and the importance of uh, place. Edward Casey and Jeff Malpas, Malpas are philosophers who at the end of 20th century and at the beginning of the 21st century also, especially Malpas, have written extensively about places and spaces from phenomenological and philosophical perspective. And uh, uh, their writings constitute the theoretical framework for my work, as well as uh, German philosophers Bernhard Waldenfels' ideas about uh, phenomenology of the stranger and the university as a liminal place, the grand sort, as he used to say. This is one, so to say, purely philosophical background. The second uh, uh, current, so to say, is uh, from humanistic geography, uh, where I can outline the names of Ifut One, Edward Relt, and David Simon, and they say right about the importance of places and spaces. And then from higher education perspective, I want to outline uh, Jan Maschelein's uh, papers and works when he emphasizes the importance of walk and looking and, you know, by uh, thereby uh introducing the aspects of place and Spain uh, place place and space uh, above mentioned uh, placeful university the notion which was developed by Norgard and Benson as uh, I see in this paper and the uh, idea of ontological education and trust which I find in Paul Gibbs writings and uh, in between is an encounter by Nicholas Standard well I guess there is too many a richly textured theoretical perspective, but I find all in some point interesting for my uh, project. Okay, so uh, the main point for me is to study international students' place worlds. And what do I mean in place worlds? Uh, this is a uh, term introduced by, as far as I know, by Edward Casey, philosopher. This means all the places which uh, 
person visits, where he dwells, where he finds himself at home and which is which he finds as a center of meanings. So at East European University, we have many international students uh, and mostly from India. And uh, so far, no, no one has studied uh, in Georgia, say a place worlds I and mean, how they how they move in Georgia, what are their uh, uh, favorite places or spaces or safe places where they feel unsafe and how. So uh, the my main question is the first one, what are the elements of participants? I mean, this international students place world and what is the, what is the role or place of the university in this they are larger place world? And then what kind of processes uh, are that strengthen their place world? I mean, when they come and they find that university, uh, all they need, I'm, uh, I mean here, uh, help and so on. And so this means that they have their own places at university where they can develop and feel at home. Or perhaps uh, when they go outside, uh, there are some kind of exclusionary places or spaces where they feel unsafe. And so what are the processes which on the one hand strengthens their place worlds and on the other hand uh, diminish the sense of security or disrupt and create danger to those uh, place worlds and uh, also what is the participants perception of special interventions what does this mean i will uh, explain quite shortly uh, so uh, at first i tried to create so so to say a workshop in my in my room and I had the idea that every student should have its own cup. I thought that how, how could I speak uh, uh, to them about places and spaces if I um, do not create a place uh, for them, even in my room. So I, I told them, bring your cups and uh, we can sit down, drink coffee or tea and discuss, think about something think, and exchange our ideas about uh, places and spaces. And one of the points was that I asked some of them to write uh, diaries uh, in India uh, with particular emphasis on spaces and places. And then we are discussing their diaries and they also going to write diaries here in Georgia. So I will, you, I'm using the method of autoethnography. And before that, we had special seminars with them, acquainting with the method, how to write this, and in order not to be you know, unfamiliar with this. I'm also going to make in-depth interviews with them during the year, so it's perhaps one or two year long project, and also make focus groups in order to understand more deeply their place worlds and uh, their experience with places, Indian as well as uh, Georgian. And I'm also uh, intending uh, from the, uh, in, so to say, excited by Marshall Line's ideas of experimental pedagogy to make joint and individual walks through various parts of the city, Tbilisi, where we live, and this I call special interventions, and then just to analyze our impressions and exchange this, and I think this will be also very interesting, not only, think, not only receiving the information about their place experiences, but actually also creating these place and space experiences and simultaneously receiving feedback from uh, them. Okay. And uh, lastly, goals, because also influenced by Marshall Line, I think that the goals should be at the end, because for me, it is an open-ended project. And I have very general goals. I don't have kind of very, uh, those goals which I can measure perhaps. So practical goals is to improve the quality of university life, to create for students the places and where they can feel uh, safe and uh, uh, fulfilled their potentialities and thereby to enrich the place world of the university and inter intellectual goals are related to the study itself and they are in this sense more uh, narrower okay so this was all thank you for your attention and uh, i will be listening to your questions and uh, suggestions if they are thank you very much Thank you very much, Georgi, for organizing this event. It's been fun thinking about it and learning more about it, revisiting old ideas, learning new ideas, and especially talking to a group of philosophers as an anthropologist. Uh, I'm leaving this first slide on the screen because it basically says everything that I'm going to say. Uh, let me give you a moment to just go through it because mostly what I want to do is show you some pictures and then comment about them as a way of, uh, a different way of reading the, the built environment. 
it's hardly news that the built environment influences what happens in it. We know that. Uh, but there are lots of different ways of learning how to look at it and read it, and also to read it on multiple levels. In the case of most universities, the built environment is not necessarily planned coherently. There are a few brand new universities that have been founded and built in an intentional way, but most older universities are accretions of different buildings and different structures and so on. And, and so learning how to read how those parts relate to one another is at least one of the things that I'd like you to think about. So I'll be quiet for a minute so you can concentrate and then we'll move ahead. Okay, to move ahead. Yes? You mean slide changed? Got it. Okay. This the first thing to do with a placeful university is figure out where it is. So I'm starting with the map of the northeastern United States. This is New York State. What you see here, the, does the cursor show up on your screen? You can see the cursor. The this area here are these are lakes, glacial lakes. These are the Great Lakes, Lake Ontario up here, Lake Erie over here. This is Long Island down here in New York City. This is where we are, right here in the middle of the, this, which was the territory of the League of the Iroquois. Uh, so uh, from many points of view, the, the university is built on stolen land. Now we move in, you can see this lake, this Cayuga Lake. At the foot of the lake is the town of Ithaca. All kind, you'll notice on the map that many of the names are classical names because the soldiers who took this over after the Revolutionary War had classical educations. And so some, for some reason or other, they thought Ithaca looked like Ithaca. Uh, and they have, there are others, uh, as you see, Ovid, Romulus, there are all kinds of names. And then there's some native names and some English names. The town of Ithaca is where the university is, along with three other universities. This is the foot of the lake now that you can see here. These are two waterfalls, the rivers that fall down toward the lake. And the Cornell University campus is right here in the middle of all that. Up a little closer, you can now see the, perhaps see the rivers a little better. Um, and that the waterfalls are quite spectacular. I'll show you pictures of those at this point. This is one of them. So the campus is literally cut from two sides by these waterfalls. Quite pretty, uh, quite cold in the winter, as you can imagine. This uh, building was the original president's mansion. Our president, rector, or vice chancellor, depending on what country you're in, uh, built this house and lived in the center of the campus. No longer is that the case. It is now the Society for the Humanities. It was a museum for a while. Uh, the lower slide is the dining room. It's quite a, quite a pretty place. Uh, it has a kind of historicity about it. The students think it looks like a haunted house, that there must be ghosts in it. At the top here is one of the three original buildings. The, the university was founded in 1865, and there were three buildings on this side. Uh, this particular building actually houses the anthropology department. This is now political science, but they've gone through many transformations over the years. So that's one style of architecture, something to keep in mind. This is much more typical of the kind of architecture that's now popular among senior administrators. Big square buildings, lots of glass, atriums, all sorts of interesting and highly structured spaces, an awful lot of rectangular lines. And you can decide what to make of that. This is a very foggy picture, unfortunately. This is uh, the bunker. The, the bunker meaning this is where the central administration lives. 
It's, it's one of the ugliest buildings on campus, which is interesting. It's also right in the center of the campus, uh, which means, of course, that if there are any problems on campus or if students are upset about anything, it's very easy for them to get there. Uh, and this has caused a, a number of problems in the hi history of Cornell was in 1968 that that building was taken over by an, a group of armed students. And there was a standoff that lasted 61 days. This is a, uh, the student meeting place and uh, a place where the students can meet and have all sorts of activities. Down below is one of the earlier dormitories. This is a, a largely residential university. Students live on campus, not all of them, maybe 60%. You can see that these buildings were built on an architecture imitating Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, this was enormously popular in Northeastern universities to make buildings that made it look like the English universities. This is an area called the Cornell Plantations because the Cornell University is also the agricultural, public agricultural and veterinary university of the state of New York and has plantations, has experimental uh, greenhouses, farms, uh, animal husbandry, all kinds of things going on. And this is set up as a, as a walking area and as a, a recreational area at the end of campus. The campus itself is roughly 880 hectares in size. Okay, now, uh, let me point to the different parts. Here's the College of Arts and Sciences. So that would be, as it says, arts and sciences includes the humanities, the social sciences, physics, and chemistry. This is the College of Art, Architecture, and Planning. Arts and Sciences also reaches over to this side. That's where the oldest buildings are that I showed you. Over here on the public campuses, the public side of the university is the Faculty of Home Economics, now called uh, Human Ecology but it used to be called home economics. This is the New York State Faculty of Industrial and Labor Relations. Down here is a private college of engineering. Here is the private college of law. This is the agricultural and life sciences part of the campus, the experimental fields that go with that, the college of veterinary medicine, the experimental greenhouses. And if you keep going out this road, you get to that Cornell Plantations area that I showed you. Reading this map <clears throat> tells you a couple of things. It, first of all, the arts and sciences are kept quite separate from the agricultural sciences, veterinary medicine, and home economics. Uh, they're also separated from engineering. They're separated from art, architecture, and planning. Industrial and labor relations is considered to be a more applied activity. Therefore, if you go to those buildings, you're expecting courses with more practical orientation. The law school is a world of its own, uh, <clears throat> primarily uh, training lawyers for legal, direct legal practice. It does have a legal clinic and some public side to it. Uh, if you look at the some of these gradients in terms of larger principle. American universities are set up, most of them, is that in the first two years, the students take a distribution of courses in all, in a range of disciplines, sciences, social sciences and humanities, they're obligated to do that. In the third year, they choose a special, and then they dig in for two years into that specialty and graduate with a general liberal arts degree, but with a specialty in political science or in engineering or whatever it is that they happen to choose. Um, <clears throat> which means that, they, that the students are actually mix all the different kinds of disciplines together for a couple of years, taking courses in different places. But from the student's point of view, Fulfilling these distribution requirements means walking between different parts of the campus, walking between different buildings. So if you're going to take a course <clears throat> in literature, you walk across this quadrangle here, 
to the, to the building that houses the literature departments. If you're going to take a course in physics, you walk past that up here to where the physics and chemistry buildings are located. If you're going to take a course in art, you walk over to the architecture, art and planning locations and so on. That the, the point is that the students have to move physically from one unit to another in order to study a different subject. That, <clears throat> and yet the idea is that they're getting a general perspective by combining different sorts of disciplines and perspectives that help them have a more general and rounded education. But they get this more general and rounded education primarily by walking between buildings between buildings that house people who very few times in their careers talk to each other. So the idea that a, that you, that a physicist and an anthropologist would talk to each other only if they happen to you know, belong to a club or something that, where they see one another, uh, all these buildings are relatively hermetic, disciplinary buildings. They literally, it, they house the disciplines. There's an anthropology floor, there's a history floor, there's a geology floor, there's, each one is uh, quite separate from every other one. Okay, so one of the experiences of the students is that, that you know, we are supposed to combine the disciplines, but you have to do it by walking around and you have to figure out how they fit together. It's your problem. So rather than providing a kind of integrated liberal education, even this floor plan, requires students to see these as separate disciplines, separate activities, and to, to realize that the faculty in these different places, many of them do not know one another and aren't terribly interested even in getting to know one another. Okay, so enough said about that. There's, I drew a long line across here because I also say there's another way to read this map which is in terms of the, the massive distinction that humans make between nature and culture. If you think about the location that we're in, there is, first of all, there's the gradient of nature outside the university, the, those treed in areas with rivers and waterfalls, uh, and out this way toward the Cornell plantations, which is a manicured, but very nice natural setting. And finally, out to the country, down this way, you go to the city. So that as you're walking back and forth here, you're also walking across major cultural distinctions and major, major differences in the way the layout looks, the way you read it, the way you understand it, the way you sense it. Uh, in addition here, it, there's a big bifurcation in the campus between these disciplines here, which are mostly understood to be on the cultural side, whatever that might mean, and we can have a conversation about that. And these, which are agriculture and biological sciences, veterinary medicine, experimental fields, which are considered to be on the nature side. So the university is also driving home a kind of message about the distinction between natural and cultural things, a distinction that that students are told but understand uh, because they live on it and they walk through it and it affects them. So in a certain respect, the curriculum and the principles and the philosophical principles that underlie the curriculum are, are built in to these physical environments. Here's another kind of map. This is one of 16 organizational charts that my university produces. Um, this is the first of them, running down from the president at the top to the provost and on down. The interesting thing about these organizational charts, if you think of them as another kind of map, is that on the 16th map, which gets to the lowest level, the bottom of the map, the bottom line, are the deans of the different faculties. The, the, the faculty themselves and the students don't appear on the organizational chart anywhere. And so, the, so it's also interesting what's mapped and what's not mapped. Now, American universities have gone 
into a kind of theme park mode in the last 20 years, having become more and more commercial, more and more so-called customer oriented, attracting students, trying to build their reputations. So they build signature buildings, health spas. This is one of the most famous ones, the college experience, whoops. This one is called the Lazy River at the University of Mississippi, which is a recreational facility where the students can get on inner tubes or floaters and float around the campus during their leisure time. And that this is supposed to be a significant contribution to the college experience. Named locations, named buildings are literally sold to the highest bidder. Uh, Gates of Microsoft has a building named after him at Cornell. Uh, Duffield has, of Oracle has a building named after him because he gave $35 million to help start building the building. So you have all kinds of names around the campus. And these are names of big donors uh, or important people. Once in a while, a building will actually be named after somebody who didn't give money, but who had who played a significant role in the development of the university. This is the football stadium at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. It is actually the largest football stadium in the United States. It, it holds 118,000 people. This is a university facility. And the coach of that team earns eight times the salary of the president of the university. And if the team wins, uh, they get an enormous amount of money from selling souvenirs, t-shirts, sweatshirts, uh, pennants, and so on. So there are all these things going on. So the question that I was answering was, what are the educational, cultural, existential messages that these environments convey? Why do they matter? How can you yourself become a better uh, observer, better analyst of these hidden, well, it's, called, it's a concept that's in, in use a lot in studying education, the hidden curriculum, things that aren't articulated but are there and that you imbibe in the process of being educated. How different would a university education be in an industrial park, separated in different buildings across the city as they have been and as they are in some places? How does the place matter for what actually happens in the place? And so the, the question that I wanted to leave you with is, you know, if you intentionally wanted to build a university, based on the idea of transdisciplinarity, integration of knowledge and building a, a more solidary and informed citizenry, and you had the opportunity to design it, how would you design it? How would you make the physical place support another kind of hidden curriculum? And with that, I'll stop, thanks. Very nice of you to introduce me that way. And thanks a lot for, organizing the, the event and uh, for co-hosting together with PATH, which we are really, uh, really happy about. And you're also a very engaged PATH member. So that's great. And thanks to your colleagues at the East European University too. I look forward to continue the discussion and um, maybe I'll move a little from uh, geography and anthropology to more philosophical speculation for a brief while. And uh, I don't think I need to apologize for that, but I don't know if it's wise. Let's see. And also, uh, I'll move from sort of place or placing the university to to unplacing or ungrounding the university, uh, and to 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 this, to think about that a little bit. Uh, I also will try to share my screen. Let's see. <clears throat> Is that okay, Georgi? All right. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. So the University Beyond Place, um, just as a starting point, also with the book, uh, in the book with Ryan, um, we have, have a chapter called On Fixing the University. And we sort of discuss also what, what you have been mentioning, Georgi and, and David, how, how the place can also be maybe a challenge. It can be a, a way of bordering or new forms of uh, protectionism. 
marking out where the university is and where definitely what's not the university, but well, that it's, that's outside um, in the periphery or in the town or, or, or whatever, but it's a sort of a, a fencing in. And that ha also happens with uh, virtual platforms um, that sort of protects a university domain through security codes, access codes, and so on and so forth. And as you just mentioned also, uh, David, uh, and I'm looking at a building here, uh, just 20 meters from me, and I can't get into it. Uh, it's part of my sort of sub, sub campus, but I don't have the key card. Uh, it's a, a sort of fragmentation of, of physical siloing uh, of our ca campuses. It's, it's quite weird. Um, places can also be used for competition, where universities in the same country, in the same region, compete against each other for the same money, same students, student cohort, the same international contacts and contracts. And it can be a way of uh, keeping uh, foreigners at bay um, to make it much harder to get a permission to go to a certain country to study. Um, for example, Denmark, just to mention an, a random country, maybe not so random, but I think the sort of the neo-nationalist turn maybe in Denmark, hopefully, is, 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 uh, is changing. Uh, let's see, fingers crossed, but, but it's, there's some, some interesting and good signs about that. But uh, having courses in Danish and not in English, not providing funding and so on and so forth. So the notion of place can also be a form of de-internationalizing higher education. Okay. That's a place to start. So um, I'll just provide four very brief uh, philosophical glimpses um, because I think there is a, a, a thread running through philosophy, which is about on grounding and on placing, which uh, I think could also be quite fun to, uh, for us to think about. And I know these are super, uh, super brief uh, glimpses. Plato, we discover the a notion of leaving, of leaving the cave in the famous allegory of the cave. It's about leaving the place physically, of course, but also the status in society and leaving the worldview, uh, something that you leave behind when you move uh, out of the cave. So it's a moving away that is, seems to be favored and not a, a way of grounding and, and dwelling uh, actually. And in the Republic, uh, Plato also writes that, of course, when you leave the cave, you become blinded and dazzled by the light, confused. And if you should go into the cave again or into the cave again, you would not be able to see much because you have this new vision and you see, see things uh, differently. So returning, maybe Georgi, for your students, it could be interesting to know how they would see their return not to say that they left the cave, but they definitely left something and they will, you know, return again um, to, uh, to the old place in, in, this, uh, in this form of uh, compar uh, comparison. And also people in the old place, at least in Plato here, would um, be provoked by people coming back and uh, they've been ruined. Their vision has been ruined. Um, and uh, maybe it's... Um, maybe it's also a provocation to, to the old place. So if you enter the cave again here in, in Plato's uh, notion, you may get uh, laughed at, or as he says later on, even killed. Um, in uh, Kierkegaard, a Danish philosopher, the notion of uh, unplacing or ungrounding is uh, central too. Um, and when you experience this uh, ungrounding, Existentially, uh, it's uh, it can be an exper in exper in, um, experience of of anxiety, not fear. It's not something that you not that you move into an unsafe place, but you existentially, but not necessarily personally. C could of course mean both. But Kierkegaard mentions that uh, anxiety is also compared to distance, and um, we, we experience anxiety when we're actually looking into what's not beneath our feet. We realize it's a yawning abyss. It's not something that upholds us. Uh, there's nothing there really. We think there is. We think there's you know, social customs and norms and habits and values and uh, so on and so forth. But really there's, there's nothing there. And that's, uh, that's uh, the sort of the dizziness of freedom. 
because uh, we look into in our own possibility. So the experience of freedom in, in the Kierkegaardian sense is also an experience of, of being ungrounded. So the ungrounding is absolutely necessary uh, to experience freedom. And that goes maybe against something we have discussed initially. So that could be interesting to return to. Uh, another example, and I know this is uh, uh, very, very quick, um, but in Friedrich Nietzsche, we also find this uh, understanding of becoming instead of being, that the uh, true growth, deep learning, transformation is possible because our nature is one of becoming, not, not one of actually being uh, or settling, uh, hardening into a certain form, but co constantly transforming, as it were, as it uh, a, a perpetual becoming or perpetual transformation. So Nietzsche also really celebrates uh, the sort of the this process of crossing over and uh, celebrates man for his uh, uh, his nature as a, a form of crossing over instead of being something that that settles or uh, is is more essence like. And here in Das uh, Buch Sarthustra, Nietzsche writes that mankind is a rope fastened between animal and over man, a rope uh, uh, over an abyss, a dangerous crossing. And uh, Nietzsche writes that what is really great about human beings is that, is that they are bridge and not a purpose. So they are sort of connecting to something that they don't know what they are connecting to, but it's a sort of a, a moving towards the unknown. Ron has also explored sort of moving into something you do, you do not know, uh, but you still try to form a bridge. So that's a sort of a, the, I don't know, par paradox in a way. And he also writes here that uh, he sort of celebrates the people who, um, who are going under because they are the ones who cross over. So people spending off their own place, maybe giving away what they have or giving away of the certainty again and the solidity of their being and the firmness of the identity. So spending that maybe also with some personal cost, but in, in that process, there is a form of, of crossing over. And the last example I have uh, here uh, today it's from Martin Heidegger, as you also mentioned, Georgi, and his notion of uh, the threshold. And this is sort of in between space or in between place. I think Paul was saying in between space. I don't know if you can say in between place, but uh, there's some semantics about that. But that's sort of liminality, that uh, in betweenness, uh, which is perhaps what we should discuss and not the notion of place, but the in between different places. But we can, of course, uh, uh, discuss that. What is connecting is what's been between. It's not the places, but it's what is between the places. Maybe David's talk about the walk, sort of that's in between, right? It's in between something and that's what connecting, uh, but it cannot be reduced to either world. So it's in between two places or several places or place worlds, as you mentioned, Georgi, but it cannot be reduced to any of them. It sort of confirms the in-betweenness. And, he, and Heidegger mentioned that the threshold is a ground beam that bears a, the doorway as a whole and it sustains the middle uh, between, uh, between two places. It's a threshold that bears the between uh, and it is the dependability of the middle and that can never yield uh, and become reduced to, to either of the places. So that dependability, uh, which is still a form of a pathway or passage, uh, something that connects, the, there's an interconnectedness through something that is between places. It's not the places that, that interconnect, it's what's between them that interconnects. And that sort of settles, uh, settles the, the, the betweenness. The threshold is the joining, as uh, Heidegger writes. So maybe we could also uh, discuss more if universities should be place resistant and try not to become uh, too placeful. I don't know if I'm going back on something I, I wrote before. Maybe that's okay to be, uh, I don't know, incoherent. Maybe it's not, I don't know. But uh, if we should be more place persistent, uh, if universities should really take care not to settle too firmly and to be too consistent um, in order to then exclude and not be open and able to connect. And again, this notion of universities as arenas for liminality is uh, very important, I think. Uh, also, I think what, what you both point to, uh, Georgi and, and David here, epistemically and culturally, 
uh, how can universities exist on the threshold and not and resist the temptation to become a place because it maybe it's much easier to become a place that's a uh, sort of keep yourself in the in the in-betweenness here um, in in the Kierkegaard quote you would also see in the last tracing there was a the, the finiteness is what sometimes we rely on what becomes the the rail because it's much it supports us it's much safer if you can sort of rely on a place if you look into the abyss you know there's nothing much there to to rely on but that's again the threshold the sort of the the, the opportunity uh, of new forms of connections and i just want to uh, maybe conclude on that note also with uh, inspiration from an American philosopher, Alfonso Linguis, and his, his book, but also his notion of the community of those who have nothing in common. And Linguis would argue it's, it's much easier to form communities uh, based on what you have in common, what you share, common history, uh, sets of values, background, where you grew up, your educational background, gender, age, so on and so forth. Um, it's much harder to form communities with people you have nothing in common with, but that form of community is the stronger one, I think it would argue. If you actually manage to form a community with strangers, as he writes, that's the strongest form of community. So we need to form communities between universities that are definitely not alike um, and not try to maybe streamline too much in new inter-institutional inter alliances. That's, uh, that needs to be carefully done, I think. And there needs to be some hesitation in that form of collaboration. So it doesn't become uh, sort of assimilated into a form of sameness, but we keep the, uh, the differences or the, dif the differences and we, we manage to operate in the, in the betweenness where we can really interconnect. All right, I'll stop here. Thanks a lot. Thanks. So I hope everybody can see my slides, uh, and I think I'm seeing one or two nods already, which is a very nice sign for me as a di digital dinosaur. Uh, so let's hope things go fairly well in the next few minutes. Thank you very much, Georgie, for your kind uh, 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 remarks about me. Um, as I've been sitting here listening, I'm just thinking about myself and my place. Where is my place? Uh, well, I'm sitting here, as you might sense, in my home. That is my place. But if I leave my front door and walk down the street, is that my place? Uh, and a mile away, uh, I live in the suburbs of London, southwest London. Uh, we have a, a suburb called Kingston. Now, Kingston is, a, is quite famous because it actually saw the crowning of five kings of England in the Dark Ages, even before the Middle Ages, can you believe? Is that my place? I've lived around this area for most of my life. Now, in, on Thursday this week, by chance, sheer chance, I'm traveling up to Durham in the north of England uh, to my old university. I've hardly been back there in the last 40, 50 years. Uh, is that my place? I'm, they've invited me to give a talk. So the notion of place is very interesting. Uh, where is our place? Is it here and now? Is it somewhere else? Uh, so I want to build on these thoughts. And by the way, I think we should just stop, actually. I don't think you should be listening to me blithering on because we've ha already had so much uh, that's so valuable. And I think we should have a, a general discussion now. But anyway, uh, so I'll just chance my arm and say one or two quick things and we'll see how we, we go. Um, let me just move on very swiftly. Um, but I want, let, I want, let me just start, start in this way. Why is place so important now today? And why is the place of the university so important today? I think these are vital questions. And I think this webinar, if I can say so, is, is very timely. Now let's move on. So I want to say a number of things. I'm gonna try and be very, very swift. Uh, I could spend a little longer than I intend, to, uh, than, than I'm going to. Um, I just start with these general observations. The world is in motion, nothing very fancy here. And it can be understood as a number of ecosystems, which are themselves in motion. And each ecosystem this is partly what we mean by an ecosystem is itself in conflict and is intersecting with all sorts of other e ecosystems. And moreover, 
each ecosystem is falling short of its possibilities in the world, that each ecosystem is impaired in some way, or is falling short of its potential and its possibilities. This is how I see part of the structure of the world. Uh, and these ecosystems are massive and exerting real forces, generative mechanisms, as we say in the literature, on the world and therefore on universities. So that's the first general starting point. And how do we understand the university in all of that? Well, the university is caught in this web of intersecting ecosystems. And I want to suggest it intersects with eight massive ecosystems in particular. And there you have them on the screen. Knowledge, learning, social institutions, call it society, persons, each person considered as an ecosystem, the economy, culture, the natural in environment and the polity or the political sphere. Now, the three points about this big uh, set of intersecting ecosystems and the place of the university in relation to these ecosystems. First of all, there's a dialectic going on between the university and each ecosystem and has no resolution. It's fraught. It, each and each ecosystem, I've just been saying, is internally in conflict and there are conflicts between each ecosystem as they bear upon the university and the university experiences this. Culture and the economy are clashing as they bump into the university. Is, is, is the education of our students, is it a place for their growth as persons or is it a place for them simply to become economic units? So these ecosystems are themselves colliding as they come into the university. And we see this all the time. Just think of big issues about academic freedom and culture wars and so on and so forth. What we're seeing are clashes of the ecosystems as they come into the university. And what's more, the university, I want to say, is in part culpable for the way in which each ecosystem falls short of its possibilities. So I want to say the university is part of the plight of the university to find itself beset by these massive ecosystems. And this isn't just airy fairy up there in the ether because it affects individuals on the campus. S students are committing suicide. They are on incredible stress. And I'm afraid academics commit suicide. These ecosystems bash into each other. They come into the, the university. The university tries to engage with them. And the result is incredible stress. Complex systems bumping into each other and the way in which we understand the world. But it's a situation of total emergence. Things are happening all the time. New possibilities are arising all the time. So what is the place of the university in all of this? Well, let's put it in colloquial terms, the university has to know its place. But what is the place of the university amidst this crazy world that I'm trying to portray? The place of the university is to choose. Four planes of the university. We know this, we feel it. As an institution, as an idea, there's the institution, but it's also a set of ideas of what we hope the university might be. It's also in, in, in time, it has a history, it's here and now, but it has future possibilities. It's particulars, it's technologies, it's resources, it's persons, particular entities, but then the universals of the university, truthfulness, freedom, openness, et cetera, et cetera. And they are in conflict because there are many ideologies in the world which threaten these universals of the university. And then we have dominant ideologies, marketization, entrepreneurialism, whatever it might be, but the, we also have resistant and alternative values and frameworks which are trying to evolve in, in their own way. Each of these four planes are present all the time as the university is trying to move in and with and through all of these ecosystems. There's no resolution to any of this. This is why place is so problematic. The universe is always becoming, always moving restlessly across and through uh, uh, these, these planes. The university isn't fixed and it's always in conflict. 
the, partly because the ecosystems themselves are always moving and are themselves in conflict. So the university is itself a place of motion, conflict and possibility. It is multi places at once, moving in multi directions, multi, cross multiple planes, amongst multiple ecosystems. This is a multiplicity, to use favorite word of Deleuze and Guattari, a multiplicity of places in which the university has its being. And this affects us. It affects our acts, our thinking, our activities on campus and on behalf of the university. But the university has expanding spaces and therefore expanding places. So the question arises, to which places might the university venture? Which places does it repudiate? Which places does it want to leave or avoid? So the university has a place. It's supposedly, we've heard this already, a place of belonging, but individuals may feel homeless on the university, in the name of the university. They don't attack, feel attached to the university. It's not giving them what they want. Its ideologies are not their ideas or values. People feel lost across these intersecting planes of the university, and they don't have a place of their own. They lack meaning in the university, and they withdraw, or even worse. One British university has been in the news recently for, on account of a number of its students committing suicide in a short space of time. Isn't that extraordinary? Very place that we would expect to be a place, a home. Students feel themselves to be homeless. So the real of the university, I've been talking about, it breaks into the university as a home, as a place. But I also want to say that the university can expand its sense of place and can give students an expanded sense of place. And with the new echo of pedagogies that are developing, students can widen their sense of place. They can feel part of another place. And they can feel part of places where there are peoples and communities which they will never meet and engage with, but they can feel part of them. They can identify with them in all sorts of ways within their programs. So conclusions, finding nooks and crannies, finding place, new places for ourselves. The idea of the placeful university, Soren, I want to rescue you from your difficulty. The idea of the placeful university, apposite. It's full of places, literally, I play on the word placeful. It's full of places. It is multiplacial. Can it can I accommodate? Here I, I think I'm with Soren, rivalrous and conflicting wants and values and activities. This is part of what it means to be a university. Many places. Think of all the places we as academics are privileged to work in and through and with the library, the laboratory, and so on and so forth, the parliamentary committee that we're advising out in the field or in spaces like this. These places are always in motion, in turmoil. Some are congenial, but some are alienating. And suddenly a favored place, physical place, disappears in the, in the university. The student had a favorite, favorite place stuck behind the stacks and the old fashioned bookshelves in the library and it disappears overnight. And the poor student is homeless but new spaces can be forged and they are being forged all the time in this extraordinary institution we call a university. So nooks and crannies can be carved out to some extent and even learning societies can be established. Thank you very much.